What strikes me, uh, what has struck me over the course of this conversation is you've both been mostly moved by productions of Shakespeare as opposed to reading Shakespeare. And of course, the last two years has forced us inside uh, to encounter him on the page. Um, is he as powerful on the page as he is on the stage? Or does he really, does the full value of Shakespeare come to life only on the stage and back to the page? <laughs> I want to um, go, I want to go first. Okay. <laughs> And that's, I, I, there's, there's more. But... Go ahead. I, I cut you off. There. Now, um, there's, there's one more entity there. You know, there are productions and there are the plays. Mm. But there's also great Shakespeare criticism. And mm. I was very fortunate to have come of age as a Shakespeare scholar in the 80s. And Shakespearean negotiations and Stephen's other books just blew open blew open the possibilities of how one read these plays. And for me, there was just a sea change between what was happening before 1982 and after. And you can go to as many productions as you want. You can read the plays in your bed as many times as you like, but unless somebody's gonna make available a way of understanding these plays. And I'm, you know, I, I, I never get a chance to thank you for that. I, uh, but I, really, you have to be able to have models that allow you then to question and challenge those models and also to chart your own way. And to be unfair and honest, it's been a long while since I've read a book that has changed my thinking about the field. Uh, there were a lot of great great. It was a very rich moment. And Stevens was a major voice, but not the only voice that was a lot of great feminist scholars were working. It was just a rich time to be young and in the business. And for the stage, would you say that directors are the people who crack open the play? Directors kind of ride on scholarship to an extent that most people probably aren't aware. I spent a lot of time photocopying articles for directors, you know, and, and, and they want to know good stuff and they can't wade through 40,000 articles on Hamlet. They want the one that's going to help them. Mm. Stephen? I'm thinking about your, the, the way you've posed your question, Alice, and thank you, Jim. Uh, but uh, I love reading Shakespeare. And I don't have a very clear explanation after a lifetime of uh, thinking about Shakespeare, writing about Shakespeare. I just picked up, as I mentioned earlier, Troilus and Cressida again to read it. It's so complicated. It's so naughty and dense. I don't understand how anyone could possibly understand it without, I mean, and yet on, it, well, Troilus and Cressida is a great example because it wasn't such a success on stage, but, but take Coriolanus, take lots of plays that actually work on stage. But if you actually read them, you're kind of astonished by how compli complicated the, the language is. And that's what makes Shakespeare fun and maddening to teach because this, uh, students get hit hard by it because even if they've seen the production they don't realize how difficult it is it must have been difficult some of it is 400 years have passed but it must have been difficult 400 years ago this stuff is incredibly naughty and dense and the that's if you if you you're into it it's like the same experience of being into into uh um beethoven uh, uh, string quartets or in, in the Bach, it's very complicated and yet it works in performance. I don't get it. I, after a lifetime, I don't completely get it. How, what happens to all that complicated stuff that you, that you have to take, you have to read 36 six times to understand, uh, even after a lifetime of working on it. I'm ashamed to say this, but one of the, my main tasks working with theater groups right now is cutting Shakespeare down to two hours and cutting out, you know, there are passages in Coriolanus, which you and I Talmudically could unpack if we had all <laughs> evening, but an actor can't make it all the way through nowadays and be fully understood. 
so I, I'm the butcher of Shakespeare for, uh, and, and spare you some of those really difficult, naughty passages. I, I have one final question, and it's actually related to Troilus and Cressida, and then I promise we'll get to questions. But um, as, as I was taught Troilus and Cressida by Jim, uh, he alerted us to what he said was one of his fam fa favorite lines from all of Shakespeare. It's from Act Two, Scene Two. It's kind of a throwaway line unless you somehow remarked upon it. Uh, it's Troilus remarking to Hector, what's aught but as tis valued. Um, for you, um, Stephen, what is a kind of a line that, you know, is not probably the most famous line that we might have heard of that you just as yourself reading his works that you return to? Um... I'm not sure I have a single uh, sure. line, sure. Uh, Alice. Uh, I, I, I have had over the last uh, stretch of time and uh, be, before the last election, I had the words that dogs obeyed in office uh, resounding in my mind many, 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 many times. Uh, and I took some pleasure uh, in them. I don't feel that now, I'm happy to say. Uh, and I would like to say, uh, you know, the, the worst returns to laughter uh but uh in your spirit of ending on a happier note and i said earlier that i tend to think things will work out uh so i want to hold on to uh that notion uh which comes from the bleakest of all shakespeare plays uh from king lear that that uh laughter will uh return uh and uh, we'll hold on to that as a hope Thank you so much. Thank you both. Can we have a big round of applause, please? Okay, we slightly ran over, but I think it was I think it was worth it. Um, are there any questions in the room? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming out both. It was wonderful to hear. Uh, thank you for, to the library for organizing. Um, I, I, I just want to go back to some of the, the earlier stuff you talked about, about the tyrants and about uh, Putin, and sadly not very much about Trump, even though I think your book touches more on Trump than we have the time to look at now. But, but, but just kind of the political field, and, and could you perhaps talk a little about the lesser tyrants that are around, who seem so Shakespearean in many sense. You know, we got Johnson in the UK. We got Auburn, who just got re-elected yesterday or the day before. I mean, it, it's, you know, there are, you know, Macron, what, you know, there, there, you know there, there seem to be something there as well. You know, there seem to be many people around who have not the, uh, the, the, the total absurdity of Trump or the extreme danger of Putin. But 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 there are but they they seem to crop up and maybe they've always been cropping up. But but, but have, could you cast a little light on those types and characters? Well, I do think you're right that, that one could make a long list. Uh, we did you didn't mention uh, the the North Korean friend of uh, Donald Trump, uh, Kim Jong Il. We we uh, could say we talk about Duterte. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, and and you're right to think that there's a certain, there seems to be certain pattern, a certain personality type that uh, emerges again and again. Uh, I don't have a strong Shakespearean account of it. I have, I I wrote a book on Adam and Eve uh, some years ago, and I went because I wanted to think about origin stories. I went to uh, to Western Uganda to uh, observe chimpanzees. Uh, and there is a certain striking resemblance uh, of those uh, powerful, uh, dominant, brutal males uh, who are actually often uh, quiet and pleasant for a moment and then suddenly spring up uh, in a kind of extreme violent way and make sure that they make as much noise as possible and dominate the group. And I do think that that, I think Shakespeare recognized that kind of personality, uh, thought about its, and interestingly thought about its attractiveness to the group, thought about the weird way in which the group gets organized by that kind of noise uh, and intimidated by it. Uh, and he came back again and again, I think, in various ways to thinking about how it happens 
that such figures uh, emerge and why they they dominate, make this kind of racket for a long time and finally uh, disappear. Uh, but I think he thought it was a recurrent pattern. And I don't think he thought of it in terms of chimpanzees, uh, but I think he thought it was a human uh, problem that we will face constantly. Thank you for coming. Um, so you talked a lot about um, uh, censorship and then like people following Putin and his ratings go up. So with that, what role do you think propaganda plays in this and where where is it in Shakespeare and what would he make of the forms that it takes today? Um, I think Shakespeare was aware of propaganda play like Richard III uh, is a good instance of this. And Richard III is uh, a scene that he cut from Julius Caesar, but he included in Richard III, which is a scene where a, uh, when Richard is aspiring to the crown, he has men hired to stand in the back of a room and shout all hail Richard and to kind of create a false narrative that the people are behind him. So I think Shakespeare is aware, I don't think the word propaganda, it, it, propaganda is itself a complicated word. It comes out of the church, the teachings of the true church. You and I, when we use the word now propaganda, uh, think of it in negative terms, but it doesn't always have to have been a negative uh, term, but certainly Shakespeare is aware of the ways in which crowds are stirred up, crowds are manipulated. There are no newspapers in the 1590s. It's gonna be another 30 years or so before that becomes a phenomenon. So the theater itself becomes a place where people are stirred up and Shakespeare is clearly conscious of his own ability to move people in certain ways, which had to be both thrilling and frightening to him. That's not a full answer to your question. That's more of a riff on, on what you said. Mentioning, uh, having mentioned Shakespeare and Rikers Island, it made me think of a particularly illustrious prisoner who went to school to Shakespeare, the boxing impresario, Don King. And when he got out, he said, you know, his language is very floribundant. He credited that kind of language to his having studied Shakespeare. And to me, he said the most brilliant thing ever said by anyone about Shakespeare. He said, Shakespeare, man, he was some bad cat. <laughs> you know, to me, the most subversive line in Shakespeare is from Antony and Cleopatra, when Anno Barbus says, that loyalty well held to fools doth make our faith mere folly. Now, you can imagine, let's say the Wehrmacht in the 1930s and 40s World War II, they had to take a, an oath of absolute loyalty to Hitler. If they had pondered that line, if they had thought about it in a disinterested way, they would realize that their faith in that man was faulty, the loyalty. Wait. And could you imagine if you were in a position of absolute command and loyalty was part of it? We, is this the kind of thing that you would want to introduce to people? Or if you would apply it as well universally, it is very nihilistic. I, I would just, uh, that's a very astute observation and drawing attention to Eno Barbas is a useful one right now. Eno Barbas is watching larger global forces collide and he has to choose which side to follow, even as many right now leaders have to choose which side to, to follow. Um, I read the Israeli press and um, they'd rather hide under their bed than make a commitment to either Ukraine or Russia. And that's effectively what they're doing. You know, Barbers has to make a choice. And he dies of a broken heart for having made what he believes is the wrong choice. But um, in the real world right now, people are having to make choices about everything that Alice began this session with. And uh, these are as fraught times as I've ever lived through. Is there a final question? Um, thank you. Um, I was really taken by you both talking about the ivory tower and opening up Shakespeare to a wider audience. Um, 
I think that most of us come to Shakespeare when we're at school at quite a formative age, 14, 15, 16, but a lot of people don't connect with Shakespeare. I wondered, um, both as teaching but in higher education, what you think of could be perhaps changed or how can young people connect with Shakespeare and not lose it um, as they grow older? I'm, I'm gonna take that first if it's okay. I hated Shakespeare in school, went to Midwood High School in Brooklyn, was forced to read Romeo and Juliet at 14, didn't even get the dirty bits that everybody else in class seemed to get and swore I would never study formally a Shakespeare again and never have. And my, my experience of Shakespeare is based on being uh, uh, in my late teens and Freddie Laker uh, was flying planes back and forth from New York to London for about $99. And I would fly over every summer after quitting some job selling Guatemalan handicrafts and see 30 plays in 30 days. And after about five years, I'd seen only Shakespeare. And I, I'd seen, you know, 150 Shakespeare productions. So that's my database. That's my archive, as my colleagues would call it. But that's my Shakespeare. And I feel terrible for kids sitting with teachers who are bored teaching these plays and don't feel these plays. Uh, I just hope, you know, at a certain point, they reach an inspiring teacher of Shakespeare. But everything I do in a classroom is based on uh, reversing the misery I went through. Just briefly before we turn to Stephen, tell the audience about the very uh, hotly contested debate that you had with John McCourter at Columbia right before the first lockdown about whether or not Shakespeare should be translated yeah, this is for a 21st century audience. You know, I, I've, I've written about this in the New York Times and in, in an editorial. It's just one of the things that makes me crazy. Stephen was talking earlier about the richness and denseness of these and, and the miracle of, of, these, of these lines. And there's a movement in the United States uh, promoted by a, uh, a Silicon Valley rich guy who didn't understand a play he went to. So he decided rather than reading the plays or enrolling at Harvard and studying with Stephen, he would just pay a theater, the Aragon Shakespeare Theater to dumb them down into American English and throw enough money at this and I just thought that you know all there is is the language that's all there is and if you uh, subtract the language from Shakespeare don't bother doing it and um, uh, you pick your battles and this is one of those battles for me. Stephen do you agree? I, I, I had some of Jim's experience I, I, I was assigned as you like it in my case when from Miss Gillespie and uh, eighth grade. I never hated anything as much in my life. I mean, uh, I still, the, the, the words sweet my cousin be merry still give me a kind of shudder. Uh, so anything that, any, that's not just true of Shakespeare, but anything that is compulsory chapel uh, is inherently unpleasant. I mean, for, for and there, if, if, if that's all it is, then it's probably not worth uh, doing at all. My hope, about this is, first of all, of course, theater, as Jim describes, it's also tons of film out there. And there's also, how should we say, incredible Shakespearean achievements. I'm thinking of The Wire, Breaking Bad, even The Americans. I mean, that, that we have, we have a, an enormous gift, actually, in our popular culture of a kind, or to, to go back to my generation, I mean, the Godfather, works that are actually, I could explain to you, are identifiably Shakespearean in character. I think Shakespeare would have been astonished by the long form, multi-episode uh, works of art that we have. I think he would have loved them, actually. I think he was longing to do something like that with Anthony Cleopatra. Uh, but, the, but in any case, we're not incapable of this. We're, it's, I mean, it's part of our cultural inheritance, we produce works like this. And so you just have to get in terms of your teaching, as Jim said, and you have to actually like the stuff, not simply be forced, forcing it, that you're having been force fed it yourself, force feeding it to your kids, uh, and then it becomes thrilling. Thank you, thank you both so much. Can we have a final round of applause, please? And an applause for Alice for making this possible. <laughs>